So it took me a little while, maybe like some of you, to move from booking the hotel to the VRBO or the Airbnb, right? You know, it was like, do I really want to do that? I mean, somebody's house, you know, rental and hotels, you know what to expect. But after, you know, I made the jump to doing that when we would go somewhere, it was like, okay. Uh, and then there was, a, there was a new thing. It was Turo. Anybody use Turo here? Nobody uses Turo here? I'm the only one? Well, Wow. I got turned on to that. A friend of mine actually goes to the church here, um, and uh, he is stuck down in Ecuador right now in a hotel room. And uh, so anyway, um, he was telling me about this, hey, if you go somewhere you want to rent a car, don't rent the cars, is there's a thing called Turo. And it's people have cars, and then you rent their car, right? So all of you, I'm telling you, it's much better. All right, so... <clears throat> Anyway, I, I was like, a, uh, you know, it, do I really want to do this? So shout out to you, Greg. Thank you down in Ecuador for Turo. And so do I really want to do this? And yeah, so I did, moved into that. But here's something that, that's common with all types of rentals that I have learned. Before I rent them, I want to see them, right? Because some people drive it like they rent it and, you know, and then you can see that, or, or you see the homes and the, the places. So when I go to these websites and I'm looking at where I'm going to rent or what I'm going to drive when I go wherever, I want to check them out first. And pictures say a thousand words. And so I just want to show you a couple pictures today. Here's one picture, and this was a Airbnb, <laughs> right? Somebody was actually trying to rent this. And now I'm telling you, if I clicked on that picture on the Airbnb and saw that, I would say, no way, Jose. Or as my grandson says, no way, so hey. All right. <clears throat> so I would say absolutely not. Why? Because that has determined, my view has determined what I'll do. Now, here's another picture. Now, you see that picture and you're like, hmm, that's really nice. It happens to be Howard Hughes' home on Lake Tahoe. And I think... I like that. Let me see more pictures, right? So let me look at some more pictures. And again, what I view will determine what I'll do. What you view will determine what you do. Okay, so if you see an ugly picture, you're not going to rent. If you see an ugly car, you're not going to rent it. <clears throat> but if you see something beautiful you're gonna to want to take another look, right? And so that's what, uh, that's what happened with me when I first saw my wife, I saw her and I said. I like on the outside and now let's see what's on the inside. And that was even more beautiful. And so, <clears throat> so I, I married it, All right? So, you're, you're going you're gonna to rent it, marry it, whatever, but you want to see it first, right? And, and that's the same. Listen, this is the same with our relationship with God. What you view is what you will do. What you view about God will determine what you do with God. And this is what Revelation chapter 4 is about. Chapter 4 and 5 it's going to reveal to us, begin to reveal to us the beauty of the Lord. And it's going to show us some attributes of His. Now, the thing about this chapter now, uh, we've moved from the first three chapters, and John was on earth, and he had visions uh, uh, letters to write about things on earth. But now we move to heaven, and I can't show you any more pictures. I can't show you streets that were like still part, you know, a column stand or anything like that. Now it's all supernatural. It's by faith. And so we have to view by faith now. So we move <clears throat> into Revelation chapter 4. If you have your Bible, open up with me there to verse 1. And for those of you that are joining us for the first time, we're in a series called Hope for the Future where we are going through the book of Revelation because it's full of hope for your future. All right, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. After these things, I looked and be behold a door standing open in heaven, 
And the first voice, which I heard, was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, the first thing that John is, is seeing these visions, and now he hears, um, he looks again, he takes another look, and he hears a voice, and he sees a door standing open, and this voice, uh, most likely, you know, different interpretations, but I believe it's, he says it was like a trumpet, which was the same thing he heard in chapter 1, verse 6, which was the voice of Jesus, is to come up here, and uh, I will show you things. He sees a door that's open. Um, I want to just quickly address something here. There are some people who believe that at the beginning of chapter 4, where he says, after these things, some people read into, this con into the text here, and they believe that at this point, the church has been raptured and taken away. And that's not what the scripture says. It doesn't say the church is gone. and doesn't say anything about the church, church age being over or anything like that. It just says that John saw another vision. You say, well, and, and so part of the argument of that is that, yeah, but the word church is never mentioned again in the rest of Revelation uh, in, uh, in, in earth. And it's never mentioned either in heaven. I don't know if you knew that, except in Revelation 22 at the very end. But what is mentioned on both earth and in heaven is saints. So John doesn't refer to the church except the local churches in the first few chapters, but then we're referred to as the saints later on. So I'm kind of setting you up because I know that there's some people who hold to an end time belief that the church is going to be raptured and caught out of here before any trouble hits. And I want to prepare you that I don't believe that if you were to really read the scripture by yourself without anybody else's interpretation or other books speaking into your life, you would not come to that conclusion. Okay, so none of you like me now, and I will keep on reading. <clears throat> Thanks, brother. I appreciate that. Got you, Todd. So um, he sees a door standing open. And in John's gospel, same John who wrote this, the gospel of John, John refers to Jesus as the door to heaven, the only door to heaven. Do you know Jesus is the only way to get into heaven? And he says, come up here, and there's a door, and he sees this door to come in, and John goes in. John's the only one, by the way, it doesn't say that a whole bunch of people were caught up with him, just John. John's caught up into heaven, and John's there, and and. Jesus says, here's the door, come in. And for those of you that think that somehow you're going to get to heaven by your good deeds, or you're going to get to heaven by sneaking in the back somehow, picking a lock in the back door of heaven and getting in, uh, you're going to be very disappointed because there's only one entrance into eternal life in heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. But Jesus is an open door, and you can enter in through him. You can enter in through him. So John is up in heaven now and is no longer around a, a secular world, a sinful world. He's in a holy place, and things are very different in a holy place. Can you imagine what it would look like in a place where there's no uh, Burger King wrappers on the side of the road? and no cigarette butts everywhere, and everything is pristine. The air is, I mean, I don't even know if you need air. I don't know. It's, yeah. So John, that's where he's at, and it's a very different view now. Verse 2 says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, capital O, one is the Father. And we're going to see in chapters 4 and 5 the Trinity all in this pas these passages. We start with the Father who is on the throne, and we're going to see the, the Spirit here in just a moment. And next week, you're going to see the Lamb of God, the Son, appears in, in the midst of them. In the Spirit, I want to give you the best, uh, what, I found, uh, what I find to be maybe one of the best illustrations that I could use John is in a vision, and he is seeing things all around him. 
I don't know if you've, any of you have ever been to Gettysburg, uh, but there's, uh, there's about 16 of these things around the world. They're called cycloramas. And in a cyclorama, it's a painting that's 360 degrees all around you. And you can go into this experience, and you can look around, and you can see this, this particular one is the Battle of Gettysburg, and it has everything from, uh, you, you, as you're watching and listening, you hear the sounds of the muskets and the sounds of the cannons and the sounds of the bugles and the trumpets. And, 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 and you look all around, but it's more than just one day because Gettysburg was three days. So this whole mural was painted 360 degrees, but it's several days of battle that was going on. But you can see it all at once, okay? This is kind of what I think Okay, my best illustration is the best I got, all right, of what John might be experiencing in this moment. Is he's seeing all of these things, but he's focusing right now on this very particular part of the one who sat on the throne. And in verse 3, and he who sat there was like jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. What John is saying is that it was beautiful. And, and we, words here fail to convey the beauty that John is seeing right now. But he sees like a, like a jasper and like a, a, a sardis stone, he's and this emerald rainbow, he's seeing this beauty, he's seeing this glory, and it's, it's, it's not even, he's not even describing God himself, he's just seeing what's coming off of God. He's just, he's just trying to describe the radiance of the beauty of God. Now, he, he says like a jasper and a sardius stone, and in the Old Testament, the priest would wear a breastplate, and it would have 12 stones. There were three, uh, there were four rows of three stones, and each stone was a different stone, and they all had each a name of one of the tribes of Israel. And the first stone on the breastplate was the jasper. The last stone was the Sardius. And what John sees is the first and the last. He sees the Alpha and the Omega. He sees the beginning and the end. He sees the fullness of it all. And, and I can't even explain it all. I just feel so incredibly inadequate right now to preach this word to you. Because I have no, I can't put into words, we can't imagine the beauty of what John is seeing in this moment. But he sees a, a rainbow of emerald, and emerald was actually the, the stone of the, of the tribe of Judah. And so there's this green rainbow, and it's, it's just amazing, and it's beautiful. And I think of, of all, whether you understood any of that history or not, if you were to take this imagery and, and put it to life, it would be beautiful. And so, verse 4, he says, Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Okay. So there's several interpretations of this. Uh, some people think that the 24 elders represent the 12 apostles of the, of the Old New Testament and then the 12 um, tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob from the Old Testament. And that makes a nice round number of 24 and um, I don't think that's it. Uh, some people believe that the 24 represent the 24 priests that were required to facilitate worship in the Old Testament temple. Um, I think that there's some, some substance to that. 
Um, but I, I go with the third option, and there's probably more. These are just the three that I think are the most valid. Uh, I think uh, that more likely these 24 elders are angels. They're a different class of angels. And there's several scriptures that I believe back that up. And there's some that back up. They could be people as well. So I'm sick into this one because it's right. So anyway, I think, I think that in these, uh, what we do know about these 24 beings is that they are part of a private council of God. And we see this in 1 Kings and Isaiah and in Daniel. There's a private, God has a private council and their responsibility is to carry out the, the actions and the, the commands of the Lord. And so we do know that they are part of a, a special council of, of people who are surrounded, uh, surrounding the throne of God. And so we pick back up in verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Now, you know, here in this time of year, we're all pretty familiar with lightning and thundering, aren't we? Right? And it gets pretty intense around here. So we're the lightning capital of the world. We're, it's pretty intense around here. Um, imagine being right there where it starts. Imagine being at the origination of the lightning bolt or at the origination of the thunder. You know, we hear it here, and I, I, there was a light last Saturday night. I came up here to pray, and as I grabbed, there's a storm rolling in. I grabbed the handle to the door out there, and right when I grabbed the handle to open it, there was a crack of, of thunder that, you know how sometimes you hear the, it's in the distance, it's like... <laughs> Okay. When I grabbed the handle, it was like, pow! <laughs> like, and I could feel, you know, you could feel the, the, the wind behind you. And I was like, I let go of the door, and I jumped like a girl. I mean, I really did. I was, and then, then I looked around. Nobody saw that, did they? <laughs> Can you imagine being in the throne where lightning and thunder originate? Lightning and thunder are representative in the scripture of judgment. So we see that there's, this is a place of judgment. And he says there were voices uh, along with that. There were seven lamps of fire. They were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, and we determined this in the first couple of weeks that these lamps, the seven spirits, is the, is the seven spirit, uh, the spirit, the sevenfold spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. So you've got the Holy Spirit in the presence before the throne, and you have the Father on the throne, and you have this lightning and thunder and voices coming out, and then it says, before the throne, verse 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. So, you've got lightning and thunder to represent judgment and power. And at the same time, you have a sea of glass. You know, any fishermen here or boaters here, you know when you go out and the tide's high and the water's not moving at all, it's just glass, right? It's like, yeah, that's nice. You can really motor there and it's just... Beautiful. This was, a, this was a glassy sea, which represents peace and control. When Moses and the elders went up to see God, when God says to them in the Old Testament, he says, come up here, same words. He says to them, come up here. I want to meet with you. So they ascend up the mountain, and what does it say that they saw? Well, they saw God. They saw his feet, and under his feet was a brass sea. And in the midst of the, the brass sea, while they're up there, it says that there was lightning and thunder around the Lord. So this confirms what, what Moses and the elders saw 
And this glass sea, uh, some people, and I think that this is a great um, I, concept, I, I believe that this glass sea, as we look at it, as it represents control and peace, is what separates the holiness of God from the unholiness of the world. Because in Revelation 21, when the curse of sin has been destroyed and mankind is no longer under the curse of sin, the Bible says that that sea disappears. Isn't that neat? So right now we have a way spiritually to be before the Father, which is through the Son, Jesus. And one day there will be no need for any, any more division whatsoever, separation will be eternally in his presence. Lightning and thunder and voices. And, and I, you know what? I think we probably even underestimate the word voices and what the, the content is there because I'm pretty sure it was pretty loud. To hear voices over lightning and thunder, there's probably a lot of voices going on. Thousands times ten thousands, what the scripture says, are around the throne, worshiping. And in the midst of the throne, verse 6 And around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. This sounds like something from the Lord of the Rings. Um, But it's not. It is what we know as cherubim and seraphim, they're angels. And we know this because they're both described in the book of Ezekiel and in Isaiah chapter 6 as well. The cherubim and seraphim are very special angels, and they're in the presence of God. And whenever you see cherubim, you generally see them representing the judgment of God. And whenever you see seraphim, you see them representing the mercy of God. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they got kicked out. And what did God put at the entrance to keep them out was two cherubim with flaming swords. In the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah finds himself unholy before the Lord, what happens? A six-winged creature called a seraphim takes a coal and shows the mercy of God to him, touches his lips, and restores him. So they are in the presence of God before him. And then, uh, verse 8 It says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. Just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't know. All right. Full of eyes around and within. What we do know is that God is is all-seeing. And, you know, full of eyes means great perception. Six wings means very fast flyer. I don't know. There's a a lot here. He says, full of eyes, and they do not rest day or night, saying, and this is the most important part of my message today. So listen. What you view will determine what you do. What you view determines what you'll do. These four powerful, intelligent creatures, angels, are in the presence of God, and this is what they say night and day, day and night, continually. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you for that. (laughs) Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they say that over and over and over. And you think, oh, I would get so bored saying that. And here's the problem. The problem is we haven't seen what they've seen. That's why you and I have to look with eyes of faith. 
You only can see right now. We see through a glass dimly. We only know in part right now. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has in store for you and I. And there's going to be a time when you're going to look on his face and you're going to go, oh my God. And the only thing that can come out of your mouth are the words that are most appropriate. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Blessing and honor and glory and power and strength be to him, to him alone who lives and reigns forevermore. And you'll just, everything that you can say that can mean the most to you from the deepest part of your being is going to come out of you because what you view will determine what you do. And if you view God as an add-on to your life, then you will treat him like another app on your phone. Oh, yeah, I've got this Xfinity app, and then I've got the YouTube, there's the God app, and, and I just use them when I need them. They saw that he was the center of everything. Verse 9 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns down before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist. And were created. The elders fall down. I'm telling you, the the greatest fix fix for pride is the presence of God. You just put yourself into the, the eternal presence of God. And watch what happens to your life. The living creatures worship the cherubim and seraphim worship God for who he is. The elders worship God for what he does. And this is how we should worship. We worship God first vertically for who he is. And we worship him. That should spill over into the result of his working in our lives and what he does. And we worship him for that. Don't just worship God for what he can do for you. Worship him for who he is. And then watch what he will do for you. You know, our worship reveals a lot about our view. How you worship God reveals a lot about how you view God. And I'll just speak to the people that are here in the room and those of you watching. And and, and if if we're in in worship and we're singing, and I say in worship, I'm just going to speak specifically about our singing to the Lord, okay? Because all that we do here is worship. Our giving, our listening, that's worship. But when we're singing... If, if you're coming in here like halfway through the middle of the second song just because you didn't plan your day well enough to get here on time because it wasn't important to you. See, worship means worth-ship. How you worship shows God how much he is worth to you. And if we're singing songs of praise and glory to God and you're checking your phone and you're turning around and seeing, oh, Susie got a new haircut. Hey, is that Steve? I haven't seen him in a while. What's well, what kind of new notification? Somebody liked my post. I got to like it back right now. What you're saying to God is that you're worth you know, me being here. Isn't that good enough, God? I showed up. But the creatures who are much more intelligent, much more powerful than you, who are in the presence of God, have seen the presence of God, know something that you and I may or may not know, and that is this. He is worthy of it all. He is worthy of it all. (laughs) 
I know you may be at home and you're sitting on the couch. I'll give you guys a break for a second. Y'all can all stare at the cameras right now. And you're eating your oatmeal. We're singing songs. Mm-hmm. You're just bopping along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Pause that. What, what, what's the kids doing? Where are they at? Listen, I know some of that's real. I know there's distractions, and I, I, I get that. But are you engaged? Are you, are you really giving God what he's worth? I know that there's, you know, there's kids in here, and they're crying, and they're upset, and I'm okay with that. Let them cry. No, leave them here. Yeah. Uh, this part, that's part of life. But listen, there's a heart matter that God is trying to deal with with us. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? And how do you see him? Because if you only see him as an add-on to your life, if you only view him through the lens of your natural eyes, you will not worship him as the supernatural God that he is. Let's pray. I want you to ask yourself today, how much worth is God to you? Is he worthy of it all to you? Is he worthy of it all? How do you view God? Do you see him like the creatures and the elders see him, like the angels in heaven see him? Do you see him as most holy? That you would come undone when, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he, be, he came undone. you make that your prayer today. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. That's who you are, God. You are holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, that we might have an appropriate view of you, that we might see you clearly. so that we can worship you appropriately. Father, forgive us where we have fallen short of your glory, literally fallen short of your glory. May we see you differently after today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give us new vision, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Can we stand up and give the Lord some praise before we leave this place today? Thank you, Jesus. We exalt you, God. We exalt you, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come.